Hi everybody, this is Carolyn Wilkins here, and first of all, I would like to say thank you so much for reading my book. Uh, it's really, you have no idea how gratifying it is to any author to have people reading their book, not to mention asking such uh, intelligent and insightful questions. So I'm really thrilled, and um, I have them on my phone right here. So I'm just going to go through the questions and talk a little bit. And if some of the questions seem a little repetitive, I may just refer back to a previous question. Okay, so here we go. First question, you mentioned the Talented Tenth in your book. Do you believe the black community could accept the concept of collect success? And I assume you mean collective success, um, being represented by just a few people. Um, you know, it's an interesting question. I think that in some way, although it seems uh, strange to us, I think that people uh, back in the day maybe had a little bit more of an idea because they were being pretty uniformly oppressed as a race, uh, uniformly oppressed um, as, a, as, as a black person, that the idea that if a couple of people could rise above that or if a group of people rose above that, it would have a lifting effect on others. Uh, and I do think even today that there is a certain amount of that concept. For example, when Obama was elected president as a black person, I rejoiced, okay? Uh, and part of that was a feeling that he, as a black person, was kind of almost representing me, you know, even though I didn't know him personally or anything like that. Um, so I do think that that idea still has some weight, although I think it's also becoming clear in these modern times, and this is maybe one of the ways in which we may have to re-examine the nature of racism today uh, versus what it was a uh, hundred years ago, say, is the fact that there is uh, an upper structure of extremely affluent and successful black people, yet and still we have these horrible racial problems and a growing underclass of people who are completely left out of the loop. So um, it may be that this talented 10th idea uh, has not worked out, I don't think, quite in the way that Du Bois had hoped that it would. Okay, so those are my thoughts on that. Let's go to question number two. Did you ever go to learn more about Jay Wilkins's, Jay Ernest Wilkins, my grandfather, his departure from his position in the government? And are our are, are assumptions realistic? Okay, um, I spoke to, as you may remember in the book, I did speak to a man who was also in the labor department when my grandfather was there. I poked around among the newspapers. You'll remember the Drew Pearson article, uh, which basically said that my grandfather was crying uh, when he left President Eisenhower's office, uh, where he had gone to plead uh, to be kept on his job. Um, so I think, in fact, that our assumptions are pretty clear. Uh, I think that in the book I've made a very clear and convincing, hopefully balanced case for the fact that the institutional racism of the time, plus his own personality, plus the nature of politics, the nature of how black people were used and perceived in their relative lack of power in the system, all of these things contributed to him leaving the job when he did, and I believe also contributed to his uh, death at the relatively early age of 60. So um, I have not pursued it further, um, and I think the reason for that is that I feel pretty comfortable that that's what happened. 
Okay, let me go back in. Okay, so that's enough on that one. Number three. From when Jay Ernest stepped down from the Labor Department, what improvements have you seen in African American lives in the U.S., and what problems do you still see to this day? Okay, excellent question. This book was that I got to actually go to the Labor Department office in New York and in Boston here and talk about my grandfather, talk about the book, and really kind of lift awareness around that. That felt very satisfying. I felt that he was smiling down on that from heaven uh, because it was a chance for him to say his case. to be. Um, I don't think that this would have been possible in 1958. And yes, there are African Americans in much higher government positions now, as we know. Um, and all of these have been good changes. The civil rights movement has made an enormous impact and continues to make an enormous impact. Even now as we protest, um, just even the fact that we understand that we have the right to, to protest, that are legacies of a time when protest was even more tightly suppressed than it is today. That said, I think it's also very clear that there are problems. All you have to do is pick up a newspaper or look at the news. Um, there's terrible shootings almost every day. There's brutality. There's oppression. And there are more subtle forms of discrimination in terms of people's misperceptions about blacks, images of blacks as dangerous or inferior or stupid or uh, a whole range of stereotypes that still exist today and still uh, are stumbling blocks to our society as we attempt to um, become a more just and fair society. Okay, next question. When you say that your father kept his emotions and frustrations to himself, do you remember any times when he did open up and share his feelings? Uh, or did he always keep them to himself? I would say um, that because of the way he was raised and because of the time in which he lived, um, there's a deep stoicism that runs through particularly the male side of my family. Uh, they're very upright. They're very stoic. They do not complain. They don't make excuses. They don't whine feelings to themselves. I think my father was a very, very sensitive, creative, uh, deep in his heart. Uh, had he come along in a different time, I think he would have been a poet or a teacher. I don't think he would have been a lawyer, and I think it was very difficult for him. I think he had a lot of frustration, as I've expressed in the book, um, but he never spoke about it per se, um, at least that I know of. Perhaps to my mother, but perhaps not even then. I think there was an expectation in that time that, particularly men, you did not... Uh, whine, you didn't complain, you didn't cry, you didn't show those kind of feelings. Uh, it was just not appropriate. Okay, do you think that being an African American first had a lot, little, none, etc. to do with your family situation and status? Um, I think that being an African American is so intrinsically a part of me and uh, we live in such a, let, let me back up, we live in a society in which race is, I would say, one of the key determining factors in many aspects of life. Just across the board, what race you are, how we look at people, what social class they're likely to be in, what their opportunities are. Even today, even though in many ways we know it's wrong 
And even in many ways, although it's better than it used to be, it is nonetheless, we live in a very racialized society. So yes, I would say being an African American had a huge uh, impact both on my family, on what they were able to achieve in life, particularly for my parents, but even now today for me, um, I am intensely aware of being one of a handful of African American, particularly African American female college professors, and even a smaller handful of African American female college professors at Berkeley College of Music. It is even to this day um, a enormous uh, factor in pretty much every aspect of my life. Okay, hope that was helpful. All right, I'm going on. Your grandfather was obviously qualified for all of his positions. Do you think being African American influenced how and why he achieved his positions? Um, I would add to that question, why or why not? Because quite honestly, uh, I think that he was appointed to this position in the Labor Department, at least in part uh, because he was African American to fit a niche that Eisenhower had in mind for a quote-unquote uh, black person in this niche. I don't think uh, when push comes to shove, and I spoke about this a little bit in the book, that in fact my grandfather would not have been better suited in a different government position, perhaps as a judge. I think he would have made a great judge. He was a brilliant I'll back up even further. He was a brilliant mathematician, my grandfather, but he was told early on in life that he would not, as an African American, really be able to have um, a college professorship uh, at the level um, as a mathematician and so forth. And so he went into the law and he went into this other kind of area. And labor never really was his primary field. He was never a labor lawyer, per se, um, and I think they just kind of put him in that slot because they were looking for a black person to fill a thing. And my grandfather, being so supremely brilliant and qualified in many areas and being an ardent Republican and a friend of some pretty important uh, Republican fixers and doers back in Chicago um, had made an impact. And therefore they thought, well, okay, we'll put this guy here. But I think had he lived in a different era where there were wider range of opportunities available for African Americans, I think that my grandfather might have done something different. Because I do not think that he was cut out to be a bureaucrat and that was the position that he had to fill. And that was not in his nature. Mm. Okay, so I hope that answered it. Um, okay, what advice would you have for someone today who experienced what you did with the guy at the party? Ha, ha, ha. What advice? Oh, my gosh. Um, first of all, uh, when that happened, I was like 18 uh, something like that. I was a freshman in college. I was very young. I was very insecure. I was very inexperienced. And therefore, uh, I think I took everything to heart, what people said to me. And when people didn't understand who I was uh, in terms of uh, race and the way I spoke or the way I looked or anything like that, when people didn't understand it, it was uh, devastating because I was already insecure to begin with. So I would say to anyone who has gone through this particular kind of situation um, that probably the most important advice is to love yourself and to understand that other people, there are a lot of kind of, I want to say ignorant in the nicest way, there are a lot of people who just have not had a lot of experience with diverse groups of people.